Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this professional learning opportunity. I am Scott Mathias from NCEA and I will be your host today. Just a few housekeeping notes as people are joining. If you have questions during the presentation, feel free to use the Q&A or chat windows. We will be monitoring the questions and we'll try to answer them all in the allotted time. After today's webinar, I will email everyone a link to the recording as well as an online survey. Once you fill out the survey, a certificate of completion for the webinar will be emailed to you. Today's webinar, Science of Reading, what it looks like and what it looks and sounds like in a classroom is being led by Heather Sella, early reading specialist at NWEA. Before I turn it over to our presenter, let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We are truly grateful for them. Thank you for allowing us today to meet and share our knowledge and time with one another in this webinar. May you extend your divine wisdom to our presenter that she will be able to impart her knowledge to all of us. May she be blessed as she continues to bring her expertise to people who need it. Bless the participants as well, so that they will be able to glean the vital information from this webinar. May we go out and spread what we learned in the spirit of your love and generosity. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heather, thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am joining from outside of Chicago. And I'm just so thrilled to be here because this is just such an important topic um, about not only the science of reading, but kind of the next step. So what does that, what does that mean for us? So as, I, as um, Scott said, I am on the early literacy team at NWEA, and I work with many districts um, and schools talking to them about their early learning suite, um, you know, for K2 especially. So this is, um, this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. So I am going to turn off my camera just so that um, it makes I make sure that my internet is stable and I don't have to worry about that. But I did want to say hi visually, and now I'm going to turn it off as we get started. Okay, um, I want to welcome you here today and let you know that um, this is about the science of reading, what it looks and sounds like in, in our classroom, you know, getting down to the practical parts of what science of reading is. So to start with, I want to, I want to have everybody take, whoopsies, have everybody take a look at this slide right here. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes that came from an artist. And I want you just to take a moment to look at it and think about what it, this means to you as a teacher or educator. So what I love about this is it shows the power that we have, especially as um, early you know, literacy educators, thinking about how important our role is to help children eventually become adults and participate in society as they intend to, um, and thinking about um, how it all starts out with letters and letter sounds, I find particularly empowering. So let's start just a little bit with a refresh on the science of reading. Um, we know that the science of reading is um, composed of decoding and language comprehension, and those being at their most sufficient state in order for reading comprehension to take hold. Um, and we know that decoding is comprised of these very important areas here that you see here, and we will be talking about each of those today. And of course, also language comprehension, composed of vocabulary, syntax, and knowledge, and we're going to be talking um, very in depth about this area as well. So between these two components, we know that the yellow brick road to get to reading comprehension is re really fluency. And that means prosody and word accuracy and automaticity. So all of these things with decoding and language comprehension need to be in place um, in order for reading comprehension to happen and fluency really ushers in the way. 
So today we're going to be talking particularly about these two domains and how they um, contribute to um, the science of reading in terms of instruction. So what will this potentially look like in your classroom? What does it look like already? And what does it sound like? So starting with decoding, sounding out and recognizing words, we're gonna talk a lot about phonemes and then making meaning of those words so we can start to move them into language comprehension and then eventually reading comprehension. So this is a slide. This is going to be um, Mark Seidenberg, who you might know as a researcher and psycholinguist um, that has done a lot of neurological research on language and reading. And I thought you would be interested to hear what he has to say about the science of reading. I'm going to make sure that I'm sharing with audio. So one moment for that. My apologies. Okay, I believe um, this should be, this should be presented to you with audio at this time. Now. Developed over decades, it got more advanced as the methods became more advanced. It's not debate at the level where any reasonable person could debate. It's not doesn't turn on one lab or one funding agency or uh, any one method. It's an overwhelming success in the science, and yet it's had almost no effect on how educators think about reading. And indeed, people are quite willing to keep fighting the reading wars and endlessly. Okay. There's a case. With that, let's talk about, you know, the reading wars and what is happening in our classroom because of it. You know, we're all on the fence thinking about, well, what, it, what should I be doing? I've been doing this for a long time. It seems like it's been working, but now they're saying it really hasn't been. So that puts us in really a conundrum and it's, it doesn't feel comfortable. Um, this is a nice quote from a teacher, um, Mark Weakland, who has his own site that you might be interested in. And you'll get a copy of this um, video as well as the PowerPoint. But it, it begins to say that if the word gets out, about the science of reading and the instructional practices. And if schools start making really you, you know, strong use of this, this is going to increase reading achievement, especially for those struggling readers. And we know those struggling readers are our focus right now more than ever. So let's take st steps forward in the wake of the pandemic with the science of reading, just like this little guy is walking up the stairs we know that research and evidence of how students acquire re reading comprehension as the end goal, that is the science of reading. So why is it important? Because we know these early years have strong repercussions later in life. So how do we go about doing this? We need systematic and explicit phonics. We need making meaning in both the oral and written text. Whoops. And we also need systematic and explicit phonemic awareness. So here is where the science of reading meets the classroom. And these are the topics that are on the agenda for today. Um, language, comprehension, phonemic awareness, phonics and word recognition, high frequency words and sight words, cueing and orthographic mapping. At the end of each of those different components, there will be a slide like this. And it's going to list in sum some of the things that we saw um, during the previous slides about what the topic, like right here, language comprehension, what it looks and sounds like. So as you look at these, as we progress through the presentation, I want you to jot down for each of these components, one thing that you know, resonates with you for, um, for what, what it looks like, and one thing that resonates you for what it sounds like. And this could be something that you're already doing, that you wanna take note of, or this could be something that interests you to learn more about, or you know, maybe something that you wanna focus on more in your district or school. So as we get to this slide, there'll be one at the end of each component. Just take a note of two things, one from the, um, the visual part with the glasses and one from the listening part. 
And then at the end, there will be this slide. And what it's going to be virtually, of course, if we were on site, you would be able to write all these things down, but it would sort of sum up some, you know, of the really um, most powerful ideas or um, takeaways that you have for each one of these things um, in terms of how, what it looks like and what it sounds like. So let's get started with language comprehension. What does it look like in the classroom and what does it sound like, sound like? Here is where it fits within the context of our simple view of reading. So let's begin with this graph that shows the three processing systems of listening comprehension that we know from research. There is the phonological processing system that listens for and produces speech sounds. And then it gathers chunks of meaning from a stream of spoken language, which activates its meaning and processing systems. So once that is activated, then the meaning and processing system goes ahead and takes everything that the brain associates with that word and brings it forward. Then the context processing system makes meaning of the correct interpretation of, of that word so that students you know, have um, a, an appropriate understanding of what they have heard or read. And this grows naturally as students grow and progress in their listening comprehension and eventual reading. But there is a fourth processing system and that is, the orthographic processing system. So in order to read words on the page, we need this one. So although understanding spoken and written language are not different because they do share the same three processing systems, the orthographic processing system is necessary to bridge print, print to speech. And when we say speech, I wanna make sure that there's an understanding that it doesn't always mean oral, because at some point we're all reading silently. And so you are listening in a sense to that word in your head when you're able to read silently. So that is something I want you to think about as we go through the session. So in reading is an integration of speech and um, spoken language. And let's hear from Mark Seidenberg again. We've known from studies of children's behavior and adults' behavior, and now more recently from studies of the brain that the hallmark of skilled reading is the integration of print with what the person knows about spoken language. So a child who's learning to read already knows something about spoken language quite a lot, and their immediate problem is to figure out how print relates to spoken language. A child who's learning to read does not relearn the language. They learn how print, this new code, relates to the language they already know. I think the neuroimaging research is really compelling. When you look at the brains of people who are better readers versus weaker readers, or when you look at the developmental trend from being a beginning reader to a skilled reader, the pattern that you see is that the people who are more skilled have integrated spoken and written language at a neural level. It almost, if you are a skilled reader, it really doesn't even make sense to talk about language and print as separate kinds of codes because they are so deeply integrated throughout the brain. Okay. So spoken and written language. So this is an example of a student's writing. Um, so he put words on the page based on understanding from language comprehension. Here is a translation. I like to put the boat in the water because it's fun. And then we see him reading what he wrote allowed. So the invention of the written alphabet allowed for that freezing of spoken language into him being able to think about what he said at a later time than when he originally said it. So we need a combination of both of these things. They are reciprocal in order for, during the process of spoken to written language. Something else to think about is, as the student is reading what he wrote, he is sharing his language with other students. So other students in the, in the class might not understand what it means to put the boat in the water. And so by reading this orally, sharing his ideas from his previous background knowledge that he was able to write down, he is also extending the vocabulary and the background knowledge and the language comprehension of those students listening to him. 
So he is writing down words that pins ideas down so that they don't disappear and they return as spoken language. When we listen to spoken language as we read, we are comprehending. So it is a, is a cycle that goes on and on. And this is just a little overview that I thought would be interesting to think about within the context of when this came about, spoken language emerges as opposed to written language emerges much, much later. One thing that's very interesting is that beginning readers usually have strong listening comprehension skills that exceed the demands of simple text, but comprehension skills tend to be linked to limited language skills. So they often stay hidden until much later grades when the complex text begins to exceed the limits of the child's language comprehension. So in other words, it's important to make sure that students do fulfill their language comprehension um, as shown in the simple view of reading during this time, because otherwise the text and the decoding and the understanding that's necessary is going to outweigh what they, what they need to have already as a precursor for understanding. So writing and reading starts with hearing words and making meaning. So hearing the way these ideas are expressed as sentences through oral language is the precursor. Children need experiences with language that require students to make sense of ideas. And that is Jim Trelease, as we know him, um, to be our read aloud handbook author. Um, also, you can see the quote there that really talks specifically about oral, you know, listening with it, with coherent sentences and vocabulary that students might not have the opportunity to have in their life outside of school. So we know students need regular and rich reading and interactive read aloud, storytelling, purposeful, complex vocabulary, experiential learning, intentional content area instruction, all of that in order to improve their spoken language as well. So if you look at the opportunities they need, this is what it does. It offers them the exposure to all of these rich ideas and, and to expand their vocabulary in order to be able to access that complex text so that the outcome eventually will be that they will be able to gain expanded knowledge, vocabulary, and understanding of the structure of language independently when they read. So think about your read alouds and rich text. How deliberate are you when you think about choosing that text? Do you choose text with ideas and language that are specific to your content, that are specific to ideas that you think will be um, leveraged strongly in future grades or future, future content areas? Um, how do you go about um, your process in read aloud? Are you previewing unfamiliar or high utility words, using explanations like a think aloud, offering opportunities for dialogue, um, checking for understanding and supporting active listening. We know this is all not news on the scene, but right now what we're learning is this has to be very deliberate. Opportunities have to be offered in a very routine way, um, making sure that we carve out time in our day each day. We need to help students expand their, um, their, uh, their vocabulary but their vocabulary by offering them a chance to expand what they're saying, um, specifically soliciting their responses, meeting them where they are, and then elevating them to the next step, to the next word, to a different way of saying things. That's a very big part of what the research say is helpful, which seems very simple in expanding students' language comprehension. Something else is dialogic conversations. This requires um, some real interaction, offering students to share their opinions, experiences. It has to feel authentic to them and intentional. Students can definitely pick up when something isn't meaningful to them or it seems just sort of canned. So you know your students the best. When you start participating in a dialogic conversation for them, you're gonna to have to think about how they can respond back constructively. Do they have the tools to respond and interact in a conversation, knowing how to extend their thinking? This might be something that needs to be taught before you start um, rich dialogic conversations. 
So take a look at some of these things here and reflect a little bit on what you might be doing or what you could do to improve or um, begin this in your classroom. This is a little checklist. Do you use themed sets of books? See, the idea here is to really get that repetition in of, of um, different concepts and language so that there's hearing and seeing those words and ideas again and again, asking open-ended questions, again, extending that dialogue with as much rich conversation as you can for students to engage in and also to listen to. Using many things like turn and talk, which we've done forever, but doing it in a very deliberate way, teaching students to say yes and when they talk to other kids or tell more. You know, this is not a fluffy thing. Kids need to be taught how to have constructive conversations. Here are just some slides that show different prompts to get students to talk. And this will be something you can look more closely at um, when you get this recording or when you look at the um, slideshow itself. But I think what's interesting is this expansion piece, expanding and rephrasing what they say, and then repeating it to the student to see what they would respond to. So repeat the prompt to see how they have extended their learning. Crowd is just another way and some more tactics to help students participate, some different ways to use prompts. So when you're thinking about leveraging a word, let's think about how deliberate we can be. This is just a text on, you know, a new student coming to a class, um, maybe coming to a new culture. All right, so you chose this for a number of reasons, let's say, and you know that students can easily identify with something like this. So if you were to start a dialogue, what would you choose to maybe use as a word to expand on? What might be a concept that you think could get a dialogue going that would deliberately expand their knowledge and background knowledge that would be helpful for them and leveraged across time or content areas. So you could choose any of these words and think about what, they, what other words or what concepts they lead to. For example, um, you might think about alone. What other words could mean alone? Isolated, worried, the concept of only, gloomy, miserable. Thinking about different words that can say the same thing and that is referred to very often among the researchers as interesting words to be leveraged for the future. Different routines that, um, that we have been doing for a long time, especially word sorts. Um, you know, older students um, sorting words by morphology, root words and prefixes and suffixes are very important. And it's not that we don't do this, but now we have to think of a way to construct our day and the minutes in our day to provide multiple exposures. So this can get to long-term memory and prioritizing the words that you want, that you choose for them to be exposed to. Here's another um, book that I have chosen um, to share. So let's pretend this is your read aloud for the day and it's called Community Soup. You might already know it. Here is just a little background. So let's say these are some of the reasons you chose it. It's about children working together on a chore. Um, they're making soup to share. Then something gets in the way that's kind of silly that you know, causes this problem. But it's really a lively conversation about communal projects and efforts like that that, we, that we're encouraging for our students. So if we go back here, you can think about what words or concepts might you choose deliberately to expand upon in modeling or to begin a dialogic conversation. You might choose the word chores for kindergartners and bring that into a concept, into a discussion about the concept of working together. There are lots of words that we could choose from that aren't just to help them understand a new word, but that could actually you know, really fulfill the goal of expanding their understanding as learners. So to follow this up, here are some different things that um, we talked about in this section. Here are some um, things that the classroom might look like in terms of a science of reading classroom focused on language comprehension. And here are some things that it might sound like. So if you wanna just maybe jot down one of each of these things that you find interesting or that you wanna learn more about, go ahead and do that. 
And if you don't have time, you know, again, you'll be able to watch this again, um, because I know some of this you might want to take more time for. Okay, phonemic awareness. What, this is something that we're going to shift to because it's an element of listening that begins the journey to reading, right? We know that phonological and phonemic awareness are critical indicators of later success in reading, but today we're not focusing on the larger unit or the word level aspect of phonological wearing, um, awareness. We're honing in on instruction of individual sounds within the word, the phonemes. All right. This is kind of like a mic drop. I tried to you know, make that um, feeling when I chose this transition because it's kind of powerful. Reading starts with hearing, not seeing. So as a caveat, we know for deaf students, this would mean starting with the form of communication that are used to communicate you know, ideas available to them um, visually before they start translating to learning from Braille. So I do wanna make sure that that is um, stated. So earlier I shared um, a little bit about this science of reading and how we have had some really, um, you know, we've had a landscape in education where um, there has not been a lot of growth for the last 20 years with reading proficiency. So in order to find those gaps in the wake of this, um, you know, pandemic and learning um, offsite, we have to identify the root cause. And to get into that, we really have to get into some granularity. So that is the context of focusing on this next part of phonological awareness. Pop quiz. Phonemic awareness is only for pre-reading. Research confirms that lack of strong phonemic awareness is a contributing factor in the majority of reading difficulty. True. Teachers do not need to understand the hierarchy of phonemic awareness skills. That's false. And sight words and phonics skills improve as phonemic awareness improves. This is very true, an important part of reading acquisition. Weak phonemic awareness leads to memorization, and memorization is not going to play out in the long term. Make sure that we don't overlap the word sounds and letters. Um, sometimes we say, what does the letter, um, you know, the letter T says T. Well, letters don't say anything, right? So that is something that sometimes gets on different educators' nerves. I just wanted to call out to you. So phonemes are not just sounds. And the reason I wanted to say that is because they really hold the key to proficient reading. So with strong instruction and phonemic awareness in early grades, many reading difficulties really can be avoided. So here is a quote from Louisa Motes, which I know most of you are very familiar with and maybe have gone through her letters training. So have you ever noticed when you're listening to a foreign language that you don't know that it's almost impossible to determine what are the individual words? Like where does one sound end and the other begin? So when students start listening to words, they need to be able to, you know, it's, it's imperative that they can focus on individual sounds and manipulate them. So we need to re, um, retrain our phonological processing system for a new job to listen inside the words for these tiny little, little meaningless bits called phonemes. And that is a very, very important part of development for students towards reading. First, it is very important to know the tasks that are essential for students to be proficient for reading to happen. So these different tasks, blending through substitution are hierarchical. Blending is the simplest, substitution is the most complex. How do we teach these? Routines. Routines are very important when you're thinking about strengthening um, phonemic awareness skills. But so the science of reading is not really about creating a whole new curriculum or ways of teaching. It's really more about, you know, within the context of science of reading, about being aware of how you are teaching these skills and being deliberate in being explicit and systematic and providing enough repetition through routines so that students can become proficient. And here are some just examples of routines that you might already use. Um, just quick oral routines that don't take a lot of planning, that don't take a lot of time, that don't take a lot of materials, but are really priceless 
for students to hear in a deliberate and routine way each day. The gold medal routine, all right, are deletion and substitution. So if you're looking at deletion, you'll notice that these two examples here start with words that contain beginning or ending blends. So think about how skilled the brain has to be to identify and then remove a sound that truly blends into another one in sequence. Then reassemble the remaining sounds and blend them together and finally recognize and say a new word and be familiar with it. So when students have manipulated sounds within a sequence from one word to the other, they are making meaning and they're starting to really understand the sequence of letters and sounds so that when they look at the words on a page, they can apply those to the sequence of letters. So now let's go to the gold medal routine, which is substitution. To manipulate a word to the extent of substituting a, substituting a phoneme, the student has to identify each sound, delete one, add one, adding it to a particular position in the sequence of phonemes. Then blend the sounds to make a different word. So this is really mental gymnastics for the developing brain and the student is really strengthening the neurological pathways that are necessary for phonics and decoding skills. So the path isn't always linear, right? So students learn in different ways and the scope and sequence might be, you know, is very flexible. So students do not always move in a linear way. So they could be learning one skill, more than one skill at a time. Um, but they do need consistent opportunities to deepen their understanding, whether or not it's in a linear fashion or not. Remember that moving to phoneme, phoneme level um, of the phoneme level of the word can even begin before mastery of larger units. So those two things could be going on in tandem. I picked this little, this little image because it doesn't show a linear path and it really corresponds to all the different skills we're teaching and how they might be taught in different um, times, circling back to them, being comprehensive, spiraling and, and continuing repetition of skills we've already taught um, so that it's cyclical. So we don't wanna leave some skill that we taught three weeks ago and just leave it there. We wanna pick it up again, spiral it in, making sure that we are thinking about mastery and not just exposure. So routines, routines, routines. Here are some you know, basic routines focusing on how many sounds, taking words apart, putting them together, thinking about the sounds that are the same, taking sounds off words, changing the sound. So there's all different ways to instruct with routines. And some of them are more tactile than others. Some of them require clapping or moving things. But what's most important is consistency over the quantity. And you need to really know the knowledge and the relationships among those skills, which ones are more sophisticated than others. That's important so that you can see where students are graduating to and what skills are, you know, do they know um, in terms of the spectrum. So if they are manipulating sounds, then you know that they already have adding and deleting intact. So what kind of bursts of phonemic awareness can you, you know, include throughout the day? Just think about that going forward. So for example, you could think of names of food when lining up for lunch, thinking about taking off a letter, adding a letter, substituting. Um, little things like transitions give you a little bit of time to hone in on this essential skill and not make it, and make it sort of fun. Something else that's really on the scene is thinking about um, you know, the articulatory gestures that are associated with different sounds. Some students that really have trouble um, dissecting sounds and words need to see how and think about how their mouth forms that word. So when they say or stretch out that, that word to exaggerate the phonemes, they see how their mouth takes shape so that they can remember that particular sound. This is especially helpful for students having difficulty, such as those displaying characteristics of dyslexia or other reading difficulties. Being aware of different kinds of phonemes like stops or continuance um, is helpful too. So thinking about letters like mm, M that says mm, in a continuous way, mm, mm. these are very helpful when students are beginning to blend words. 
So some kinds of phonemes are more compatible with different skills than others. So this is something else to investigate um, you know, as you're starting to learn more. Sound walls are something that are becoming more and more into the picture as well um, as needed. You know your classroom and you know which students might benefit from this more than others. Um, but again, using mirrors and pictures like this might be what certain students do need. So now let's think about phonemic awareness in the classroom, what it looks like and sounds like. And take a minute to just choose one from each column here as something that you're interested in learning more about, expanding on, or you know, just sharing with another educator. So now I'm going to move on to phonics and word recognition. And this is really where the rubber hits the road, right? Because we're connecting hearing to the sounds to seeing the words through phonics. Here is the context within our simple view of reading. Here's where it falls. And we know that decoding and language need to be completely sufficient for reading comprehension to take place. The kids can't just be exposed to it. They need to master it. Scarborough's rope, like the simple view of reading, includes the same basic, basic premise. Noticing the two big factors of language comprehension and word recognition. So our goal is really automaticity so that these words get to be more automatic so that they eventually become sight words. How do we get there? We know fluency helps and there are some other things that can get us there um, as well. Pop quiz, buying a good phonics program is essential. False, not necessarily. If, it, if um, you have some materials, if you can agree on a scope and sequence in your school, if you have routines ready to go, you might not need that. It's the way you teach it in an explicit and systematic way that matters. Do the unpredictable letter patterns of English make learning to read through phonics too difficult? Is it just too hard? They just have to know words by sight because there's too many unpredictable letter patterns. Is that true? No. We can still decode some of the irregular words. There are still letters to focus on that students can map back to sounds um, to eventually move into their long-term memory. So the ability to code print to speech is an essential reading skill, absolutely. And systematic and explicit phonics instruction significantly improves children's reading comprehension, absolutely. Alphabet Alphabet recognition, does it need to be mastered before teaching phonics? No, some of this can be in tandem, right? The alphabetic principle moving you know, underneath, undergirding all of these essential skills. So a word from our sponsor before we move forward with more phonics. Here it is, phonemic awareness. All right, and here's a word from Wiley Blevins. You know, all of you probably have some trusted resources from Wiley. We know that sound spelling relationships have to be um, understood before students can decode. They must understand that words are made up of sounds. Many children come to thinking of words as whole units, so they have to be able to break those down into smaller units, individual phonemes. So if students you know, can potentially make it through the first few years um, without strong phonemic awareness skills and just memorizing, but that is not going to be sustainable and it will break down as the text increases beginning in grade three. Therefore, if weak phonemic awareness skills are not detected or cor corrected through different kinds of assessments you have, it could be um, interim or formative, those students are going to enter in an intermediate grades with a serious reading deficit that's going to affect them through high school. And then, you know, when students aren't strong readers in high school, then they're not going to develop a passion for different content areas. They are likely, you know, going to feel like they are not good enough, right? And of the 10 to 15% of students that drop out of high school, 
75% say that they have had trouble with reading. So what could possibly be a better endorsement for phonics for this commercial, um, for phonological awareness rather than this? So this little guy, um, who knows if someone forced him to write this, but it definitely is um, right on track with what we are trying to express. So deep, ortho deep orthography. The way words are spelled, letter patterns in, in a particular alphabetic system is referred to as orthography. And when this system has many different ways to spell the same sound or many sounds for the same spellings, it's referred to as deep. So English is a deep orthographic system. So um, children must also understand letters or spoken sounds and begin to blend them together for many different spellings. The phoneme graphing um, correspondence is complex, but despite all of this, English is still decodable. And decoding through phonics is still the most powerful way to help students learn to read those words. So precursors, letters are spoken sounds. And again, it could be spoken in your mind, you're listening in your head, and then writing them down, blending the sounds to form a word. So here you can see that these discs represent a different sound and then are mapped to the letters or a sequence of letters that correspond to that sound. So the, the um, Pat, the sequence is sounds and then letters. So you might, some teachers think, you know, or I, I did, we have a curriculum and we're all set. We know what to teach and when to teach it. Is that all we need? Not really. We need to keep practicing, reteaching, differentiating, assessing, um, using cumulative assessment, you know, spiraling back, looking for mastery, recursive teaching more and more repetition. All of these things factor in to making sure that your scope and sequence is um, helping students be successful. Let's take a look at Linnea Aries reading phases of word recognition. Now she is the one who is mostly known for her theory of orthographic mapping. And this is um, her path to automaticity. So you're gonna recognize these stages, pre-alphabet, so that's when they're just looking at the picture and they don't know the sounds. Partial alphabetic, full alphabetic, consolidated, and then automatic. So students, in order to get to automatic, they have to go through these stages so that they can read those words in a fraction of a second. So, a, you know, there is not yet a body of research that tells us which sound spelling to focus on before others. So there's not one sequence that's determined to be better than the others. But make sure that whatever sequence you're using, you're using it consistently, vertically and consistently across the school or district. So even with how complex the English ortho orthography is, even the most irregular words are somewhat decodable. So you can still, as a student is zoning on the, on the word, you can still find letters or letter patterns that they do know and that they can decode. Just a few guidelines, you know, avoid teaching visually sim similar letters together, move from simple to complex, teach letters in an order. So if you're developing, um, you know, your own scope and sequence, you're gonna wanna teach letters in an order that can you know, right away form some CBC words that you can leverage. So thinking about, you know, teaching C and P and A are going to be, you know, um, worthwhile because you're gonna be able to spell cap or, you know, you could pick C, A, um, P and T and you can make several different words from that. So thinking about the order of the letters you want to present is important, especially if you do not have a scope and sequence already. Beware of those letter sounds that can be easily confused as well. Here are some good resources for you that are um, research-based and also um, practitioner-friendly. So this drives it home to what are we doing in our classroom? Instructional routines. Think about are they multi-sensory? Are they fast-paced and engaging? 
for phonics, do they incorporate some phonemic awareness that they're listening to the sound, not just the letter? There are many different routines out there to choose from that you can think about working in um, to your class every single day, looking for mastery. So leverage these routines. Um, find ways to make it meaningful. You know, find ways to play with sounds. It could be direct instruction, small groups. Um, applying this to writing, um, writing and studying words with particular letter patterns. There's all different routines that you can leverage in different ways to get the most out of them. So here is phonics in this um, in the science of reading classroom. And I'm going to um, probably move a little bit quicker now because I want to make sure we get to all of our content. So here is what um, some things we talked about, about the way it might look. And here's how it might sound in your classroom. So high frequency words and sight words, very important. What does it look like and sound like in the classroom? Here's where it is within the context of our simple view of reading. Pop quiz. Sight words should be learned visually using the shape of the letters. False. We've been doing that for a while, but it's not the shape that's going to lead to long-term memory. Teachers should use flashcards as much as possible. False. Memorizing sight words is the only way to learn them. Not true. And sight words and high-frequency words cannot be decoded. Again, false. So some ins and outs. Not all sight words are high-frequency words, but all high-frequency words are and should be sight words. So many high-frequency words are easily decodable and you can just move them into your phonics lesson already. So like these here are very decodable. You don't have to teach them separately. And even some that aren't completely decodable do have some phonics rules that they abide by. Just a little history of Dolch and Fry. These are two different lists that we um, reference very frequently that came about you know, early in the 20th century and mid 20th century. Um, and there are different, you know, they ordered the words in different ways, but this is something we reference quite a lot because these little words unlock a lot of reading. In fact, when equipped with the first 109 plus, you know, um, of these sight words, children can read a lot of one syllable words that they encounter. This is just an example of our sight word vocabulary. We can look at these words and with a fraction of a second, decode them. And that's because we have, without even knowing it, mapped these words based on their sound to their spelling into um, an automatic reference in our brain so that we know them right away without any need to decode. And we can do that with up to 70,000 words. So prioritize those high frequency words that you think are most urgent for you, for your classroom, to align your cu curriculum, or that might be irregular or or similar. Um, so there are, are regular words that are similar that you could teach together. This way has been disproved. This is not the way to teach sight words that it, you will get the most bang for your buck. Instead, Ari says, mapping the sounds to the letters is the way to go, even though they are not predictable. So EY is not a predictable um, letter pattern but by mapping it this way is going to lead to the most um, valuable um, way to remember these words for long-term memory. So although it seems like we're, we're just looking at words as whole units, we look at a word and just know it instantly. The brain research is saying, no, we are actually breaking it down into individual sounds and mapping it back. So this is what, um, um, like Mark Seidenberg was saying, is um, undisputable or indisputable rather. So different routines, like looking at a word like want, how many sounds are there? What is the first sound? What is the last sound? And what sounds do you hear in between? So although this is not a predictable sound with this A sound, mapping it in there and letting the students see how the letters relate to that sound is what's going to um, um, be most valuable in the long term. I just made some copies of different irregular word routines from this book, Shifting the Balance by Perkins and Yates. 
that I included in that resource, those resources that I think you'll find very valuable. So what's faster, looking for a sight word on a wall or using speech to print to start to decode it so that it can map into memory? Here are some, um, again, some of the ideas that we just talked about from what a classroom looks like and sounds like. Cueing. This is something that will come as quite um, uh, a shock or might be uncomfortable. Um, it was for me. So we have been teaching kids to look at pictures, skip over words, guess based on context. That is not um, the best strategy for reading because good readers rely more on decoding than those cues. So it can be estimated that one of every four words only can be used using context. And also picture and context cues are not going to be available as much as, as content gets more and more complex. So even, um, you know, it's any reader strong or weak can use context clues, but only up to a certain point. Only 10% of content words are um, used, can be used with picture or context cues to help understand the meaning. And it only, you know, profits you up to a few grades before, you know, up to about second grade. After that, you're faced with more and more content where those cues will not be helpful. So as the grades increase and as the contextual support decreases, um, students need to rely more and more on actual decoding. So these might look familiar, but we need to think about how, okay, some words are easily, you know, cues can easily help students in the lower grades. But then as they get to the even fifth grade, or fourth grade, there's not the context they need to, de to figure out the word. They're going to need to go straight into the word and decode it. And so this is where our MSV chart comes into play, meaning, um, and context processing systems. Those work together. And then the visual is the orthographic processing system. We're still talking about using all of those, but instead to reprioritize, to focus first on the visual, to decode, and then cross-check with context and pictures. I have included some routines for you to have as you, um, after this presentation, that might be helpful because some of this is new to us. And so we need some new visuals to help us think about you know, new routines for students. Okay, and last but not least, orthographic mapping. This is the sweet sauce. It helps the long-term memory of word recognition. Ch children should not use it as a last resort. This is the first resort. The first, the first thing students should ch choose um, as they're trying to um, unlock a word. Words are not used, learned as whole units. They are learned by matching sounds to letters, true. And students should use orthographic mapping after they are able to fully decode words. No, this is as they are learning to decode words. So why does it matter? We looked at Aries phases. It's going to bond the letter sound to memory. Students who do this sub, um, subconsciously are gonna quickly attain more words in their um, vocabulary than others who do not. And this is what the research is saying. So for example, a word like cap, you know, decoding the word, we're thinking first about the sound and then the letters that go with the sound whether they are predictable patterns or not. So these are somewhat predictable. So effortful decoding, when you're really, you know, really laboring over decoding words and students are doing that, it doesn't lead to that automatic word recognition that they need to get become fluent readers. So we need to move more and more words into that instantaneous sight word vocabulary. And to do that, is with phonemic awareness. So starts with saying the word or hearing it in your mind, mapping the sounds, then putting the letters. 
And, um, you know, I have done this in workshops with teachers and even with leaders, and they find it very interesting, especially leaders that haven't um, taught early literacy. And I even use Starburst here to um, help sort of, you know, make it more interesting for them. But here are some different um, ways to, to teach this. So orthographic mapping in the classroom. You are going to see a lot of sound boxes and manipulatives. So demonstrating whole class or small group, this is just imperative. So asking the students the sounds they hear and then associating, associating them to the letters when a student is stuck, that is the first step. Then students are saying the sounds and the words and then telling how many um, sounds they hear, putting those sounds together and forming the word while they're looking at those letters. So as we look back and think about all of this, this is a lot of information. Sometimes it's too much, which it might be today. All right, when you leave today, I want you to think about some of the things that you might want to incorporate. Um, you know, I tried to make this very tangible and very concrete um, because that's what we need. It's one thing to say science of reading and it's another thing to say, well, how are we supposed to do that? And one thing I really want to emphasize is that we're not reinventing the wheel, right? We're all doing this in our classroom. We're all doing each of these things. It's more of how do we assemble this? What does it look like? What are our routines look like? How can we carve out time for um, language comprehension? And what does that even look like? Are we using the best way possible for cueing students when they're stuck on a word? So a lot of this we already do, but let's reframe it so that it aligns with the research. So when you get this, you can kind of walk through and take some notes that you think would be most helpful for you later. Um, but right now I know I've gone a little bit long, but I want to um, offer some opportunity for some questions. Scott, is there anything in the chat? Uh, yes, I was just gonna say, um, if anyone has a question, Feel free to drop it into the Q and A or chat boxes. Um, the first question is: How would this best be applied at the fifth grade level? Okay, fifth grade level. So, one way to think about this is for those fifth graders, some assessments, and I, and I'm, I'm not pitching map reading fluency to you at all. It is our it is our fluency assessment. Some assessments like that will reveal that even though students are decoding, they still have gaps in phonological awareness that we might not have known about. So really important. what's really important right now is to assess down to that granular level. When you are seeing students are comprehending, it might not be comprehending skills they need to work on. It might be phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, and phonics. Um, you know, the vocabulary part and the rich text is something that of course you can build in, especially with all the content. Um, that you're thinking about. High frequency words, again, mapping those content area words with multi you know, syllabic words and breaking down those individual syllables to the phonemes and the letters is really the way to go for you know, older students. Um, and orthographic mapping when they're stuck on words like you know, immigration, osmosis, hypothesis will really help those students as well. And especially, you know, those students are ripe for rich conversation and dialogue with each other, sharing with each other what they know in their backgrounds. Okay. Um, any other questions from our attendees? Um, feel free to drop them in the Q&A or the chat window. Um, and as Heather said uh, earlier in the presentation, the PowerPoint will be available. I will send that out everyone tomorrow and uh, I will also send a copy of the recording um, or a link to the recording so that um, if you want to watch it again you're free to do that. Um, okay we have another question. How would you break down your reading structure for the week? Frequency of whole, small centers, um, individual teacher pulls? Okay so you know a lot of this depends on the needs of the students in your classroom. Think about that I do, we do, and then add like a y'all do. Like, how are they working with each other to build in that, that conversation piece? Um, 
I think just looking at the time you have, you know, in that, in that um, period of time, and I, I don't know exactly what that is if you have 120 minutes, and really mapping it out so that you might say, I am not having enough language dialogue, you know, dialogic conversations. Um, without really knowing the needs of your students, I think it's kind of hard for me to say, but if you're thinking about their individual centers, really think about pulling in some orthographic mapping. That is going to really pay off for your students, no matter where they are on the continuum in terms of, um, you know, whether they need to be scaffolded or whether they're high learners. That is going to profit them a lot, no matter, no matter what. Um, also thinking about the, the vocabulary, how you can leverage the, um, that oral reading, that read aloud to them. So don't just stop, at, you know, if you're a fourth or fifth grade teacher, how are you gonna dedicate some time during the day to do that? And where do your routines want to fall? Do you wanna have, because let's try to sprinkle these sporadic routines throughout the day, as well as dedicated time. So, you know, if you want, we can talk about that. You can email me and we can think about ways to help you structure that time. Um, well, you know, dyslexic the nonsense words, there are two different camps for that. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to speak ill of nonsense word fluency. Um, you know, I think there are two different camps. And, you know, if it is, in fact, um, you know, uh, that's something that that is the leadership for you, that dyslexia should not be taught, taught with nonsense words um, and instead real words, you know, that's OK. Um, I, I think of syllables later on in life as really they are nonsense words. So when you're getting to more content, you know, um, related multisyllabic words, they're looking at parts that really are nonsense words that they're going to put together as a full word. But nevertheless, using just regular CVC, using um, that orthographic mapping as much as you can for single syllable words, even if they're not nonsense words, is, is really going to be helpful for those students. And of course, that will take a lot more scaffolding individually or a small group. Um. There's a, an, another question on dyslexia in the Q&A. Uh, what is the best way to help parents get their children tested if dyslexia is suspected? Obviously, the earlier, the better. Yeah, the earlier, the better. And I think starting, you know, triangulating the, the data you have, starting to assimilate that for parents so they can start making sense of, you know, what you're saying um, so that first they kind of have an understanding. So they just don't think, you know, what does this mean? My child is displaying characteristics. Like you've assembled some triangulated data that can be explained to parents so that they might be able to take the next steps, whether it's with your school um, psychologist or, you know, also to know where to go outside of that, which many parents want to have like a private clinical examination with their students, with their child rather. Okay, I think we're just about out of time. Um, Thank you, Heather. Um, excellent presentation, really informative. Um, as I mentioned to you at the beginning, I'm a language major, so all of this kind of stuff is is uh, really fascinating for me um, with the the acquisition, you know, how how we go about reading and and learning our language, whether it be our our native language or a foreign language. Um, and I also want to thank our attendees today. Um, if you want to see uh, any webinars that we have coming up at NCEA, you can go to ncea.org slash webinars. Thanks again and have a blessed day. Thank you, everybody. I really am so glad you were able to attend and, um, and to be engaged. And I hope that this was helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you, Heather.